Hey everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. If you're looking to grow your business and get in front of a new audience, Divergent Conversations is accepting new sponsors for the 2024 seasons. We already have over 300,000 downloads and counting all over the world. And this podcast is growing all of the time. The beauty of podcast sponsorship is that you can get live pre-roll or mid-roll opportunities where we will read your ad on air while recording, getting you in front of a new audience every single week. You have the opportunity to sponsor one month of episodes at a time where you'll get four episodes in total, or you can sponsor an entire year and be the exclusive sponsor of Divergent Conversations. This is a podcast that's being distributed all over the world. The analytics are fantastic. The podcast is growing and it is a very captive audience. Reach out to us directly via the link in our website at divergentpod.com or email us at divergentconversationspodcast at gmail.com and we can get started on your sponsorship journey. Okay, Patrick, so we've been like trying to figure out what to record today and we settled on burnout part two. So let's do that. I think it's fitting because I'm just like reading your energy and I think we're both in burnout, but I get the sense that you are in a heavier state of it right now than I am. Yeah, I, I, um, <laughs> I agree. Um, I is it contagious? <laughs> I know. I know. Is it like a contagious fatigue? Cause I know that energy can be a uh, infectious. I am just happy to be here today with you because I am mentally preparing for my world tour of five months of traveling. So whenever we can get episodes in, I'm happy about it. Um, I weirdly am like not in burnout at the moment, but I'm mentally preparing to be in burnout, which is a very strange thought process. That is really interesting. Uh, mentally preparing to be in burnout. I wonder yeah. if I, I've been lately, I've been like playing around with comparisons between chronic pain um, theory and, or like just how we work with chronic pain and then sensory overload, but also burnout. So like we know when we are anticipating pain, it increases the pain experience. And I've been curious if something's true about that with both sensory overload and burnout. Like it is interesting. I wonder if anticipating burnout is helpful, if it like psychologically prepares you or if it like sets you up in a way that intensifies it. It's a good question. I've never actually mentally prepared for it before. I've also never known I was autistic before until the last couple of years. <laughs> so I think all of this newfound information and insight is helpful in my processing because like right now I feel okay. Like it's January, it's gross outside in Western North Carolina. It's freezing, it's pouring rain. I have no desire to do anything, but that doesn't feel like burnout to me. Um, that just feels like malaise, but I think I've been in this recharge period because I've known that this very ex like heavy four months is upon me starting this week. And there's been a lot of anxiety around that, but I'm also mentally preparing for like, we talked about this a little bit last week when we were talking about meltdowns and shutdowns, um, holding space for a lot of people, attending to a lot of people, being around a lot of people, the travel, all the airports. There's no way I come out of that unscathed and like feeling recharged or refreshed by the time we hit June 3rd when this is all over. Here's if this will be your last year doing this. Yeah, that sounds mm. totally unpleasant. <laughs> so you mentioned you had some new thoughts on burnout since we did that episode several months ago, and I'm curious about those. And I think this is perfect timing because this episode probably won't air till like March-ish. We're recording as of like January 8th, 9th. I don't even know what the day is. Um, 
and we're, you know, New Year's resolutions and New Year's and our society kind of like thrusts upon us like this capitalistic hustle culture, grind culture, productivity, do all the things, reinvent yourself, new year, new me, bullshit. And like, I think this is such a recipe for burnout. And if you're already coming into the new year feeling burnt out, that just feels like it just adds this enormous amount of pressure where it's like, I already feel this way. How in the hell am I supposed to dig myself out of this hole at this point in time? Hmm. I, I relate to the dig myself out of this hole. I think that's what I'm feeling. Like my, like my health stuff is spiraled and I know that there'd be some like lifestyle changes that could help, but it's like, I am so tired all day yeah. that it's like, I can't, like, yeah. Dig myself out of the hole. It's like the, to do the things I know would help me. It's hard to have the energy units to, to do those things. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying, I'm working at it, but it's, yeah, it's, it's hard for sure. I, one of those. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I would just say I have a slightly, like it, it reminds me of our holiday episode. I have a slightly different experience of the new year. Like I, I don't sure. like new year resolutions, but I do like new year intention setting. Um, yeah. I just did a deep dive into habits. And one thing that was interesting to learn is we are best at forming new habits when hope is high and hope tends to be higher with like fresh starts. So if it's like a Monday or a morning or a new month or a new year. So if you think about like, especially this year, I, cause the new year was a Monday in a new month in a new year, like hope is high. So I, I do try to take advantage of that. I, I don't, yeah, I think resolutions feel like demands so that like I, I skip that, but I do like the freshness of um, kind of clearing intentions, um, or clarifying intentions and try to lean into those. So I am doing that, but yeah, in a low demand way, cause the fatigue is, is pretty intense right now. Yeah, I can tell and sense that for sure. And I think that I, I don't, I don't dislike the idea of fresh starts and new years, like, um, let's when hope is high i like that mentality i think i hate the societal like expectations and pressures of like what holidays bring upon us and i am very much the person where it's like oh society says we should feel this way well i'm going to do the exact fucking opposite and i also just struggle so much with the winter months like my seasonal mm-hmm. depression goes way up um my lethargy goes way up i think that i use the first nine months of the year or this the last nine months of the year to like really get into a flow state and do a lot and produce a lot. So I always end up like, it feels like you're like getting to this, the end of the marathon, like you see the finish line and you're just like basically dragging yourself across mm-hmm. at the end. And that's kind of where I end up every year. And I found I can either like beat myself up for that, change my habits, or I can just accept the fact that nine months of the year, I'm going to feel really energized. And as we approach the colder months, I'm going to start to slow down quite a bit and go into almost like a dormant hibernation stage so mm-hmm. that I can, you know, do the things that I've, I've been doing uh, on an annual basis. <laughs> my So my spouse just literally joked about that last week. He's like, you're, you're like a bear. Like you just, you go into hibernation. Cause I mean, he, and I do feel bad. Like he feels it. And I, this is, I, I don't know how I forget this. Maybe it's like selective memory, but every January is so hard for me. And I, so I live in Oregon. The winters are really long and gray and my chronic fatigue just gets so intense. Um, like I, I typically outside the winter months will have like maybe a three hour block in the day where I'm not totally fatigued, but in January, it's just like, it's a, it's just a wall of fatigue. That's constant. Um, and it's so painful. It is really painful and it's, it's so heavy. It it almost feels like minute by minute existence becomes more challenging. You become more Mm -hmm. aware of time and how slowly it feels like it's moving. And Mm -hmm. there are so many days in January and like February too, here in the mountains, like, where I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to do anything at all. And 
I have this internal dialogue of like, you're being lazy, you're not being productive versus like, I don't care. Like, I just don't want to do anything and I'm going to more likely succumb to that. So um, when we add in autistic burnout on top of just seasonal stuff and weather and temperature and getting dark out at three, four o'clock, like it's really challenging. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Luke is trying to convince me to go to California for a week next month to get sun. Cause I know like, I'm just, I don't know what kind of plant it is that just like thrives in sun, but like, <laughs> I just, I, I've become such a different person when I have sun. Um, yeah, it's a rough month. And I realized by the time like this is released, it'll be March and the days will be getting longer, which is great. Um, but yeah. Okay. So you asked about like, what are some of the new things on burnout that yeah. So I just, I read, I just revised my burnout workbook, which was like one of the first I ever did. And there's some newer research that's come out that I was looking at. And I was like, there's some really interesting stuff in here. Um, but one of the revisions that I'm making to how I'm talking about burnout, and this is partly because of the conversation we had with Mel, and then I'm, I'm collaborating with, with a functional medicine provider, an autistic functional medicine provider on some resources, who's really helping me understand like, um, chronic fatigue syndrome and like all the health things is I'm realizing that a lot of the things that we call burnout might actually be co-occurring health conditions or like this sure. January, like I'm so tired. It is so painful. Is that burnout or is that like chronic fatigue flare secondary to, you know, sunshine. And I, I, I realize this drives some autistic people crazy. I'm like, eh, if burnout's a helpful concept, let's call it burn. I mean, okay, let me nuance that. If there's a co-occurring health condition, that should be supported and treated. Um, but like, I'm not necessarily feel like I have to tease out, like, is this seasonal fatigue? Is this burnout? Like, it feels similar to burnout in that like losing motivation for my interests and just like that collapse, like burnout feels like collapse that, that feels similar to me to burnout. So like phenomenologically, it feels similar to burnout. I don't know if the cause is exactly the same. Um, but yeah. I kind of like that you just said that because that's what I was thinking about as you were talking as someone with co-occurring health conditions, as so many of us have at this point, it's kind of like, eh, I feel like crap. <laughs> like, whatever, however I label it or define it, or if I create, if I figure out the causation, does it really matter? And, and like you said, yes, if there's a co-occurring medical condition or mental health condition, sure, treat it and like cr start there. But ultimately I feel like shit, like mentally and physically, <laughs> does it really matter the reasoning behind it? Because, but then my brain says, it does matter so much in some ways because we are so wired to like figure out the causation and mm -hmm. the causation and the M and the analysis behind said cause causation can really create like overwhelming anxiety and overwhelm mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a powerful way to feel in control and like when our bodies collapse on us, I mean, what is like, that's a very like powerful sense of being it lack of control so I yeah. think when we can like pinpoint like, oh, like for me, it's like, oh, I had something that had gluten in it. No wonder I feel like shit today. Like, like that's helpful. Cause then it's like, it gives me a sense of control back of, okay. So if I choose not to do that, then I won't feel like shit like the next day. Um, yeah. Some of that might be kind of mythical. So some of it is true. Like for me, gluten definitely is a huge trigger. Um, oh my gosh. Thoughts flew away. Yeah. But th this is. Okay, the thought flew away, but there's another. <laughs> um, I think this is why I like Mel's all of the things is like there, there rarely is one thing, right? It's it is all the things, and then all the things except are. So if we go back to that burnout equation that Raymaker put out, it's like cumulative life stressors exceed our ability to to cope. Yeah, all of the things are the cumulative life stressors. The lack of sunshine is a cumulative life stressor for me right now. The fact we got a new puppy in January, which was just dumb, that's a cumulative stressor. Like, right. and so the health things are part of the cumulative stress that sure. is part of the burnout equation. 
Absolutely. Because if you add these things up, right? And I always have this, I don't know why, I always have this like thermometer image or like, you know, in fundraisers where they're like, we're Uh trying to hit this level and then each thing crosses off the next threshold. But that's the way I look at it is compounding stressors. So if we have weather, seasonal stuff, new puppies that you can't sleep or there's just a lot of extra stimulation, um, chronic health conditions, things that, you know, absorbing energy that from the stress of the world, having to go to work, like all of the things that come into play. And if we are so stretched and we are so, so, I'm going to choose my words carefully. I don't want to say limited in our, in our abilities, but really. I feel limited. <laughs> yeah. Limited in our abilities. So each thing creates this additional notch. Each thing creates this additional level of pressure and, and overwhelm and stress and dread. And then, of course, your ability to combat depression, anxiety, fatigue, et cetera, just diminishes greatly because your reserves and your resources are just gone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so this does remind me of the article that I think was like a 2022 two or 23 release. Um, of course, I can't remember the authors off the top of my head, but we'll, we'll link it in the notes. Um, but it was looking at the risk factors and protective factors of burnout. And I, I loved, and I, th- I think at this point it's kind of hypothetical. I think it was a theoretical paper that they're now going to be doing some study on, but I really loved the breakdown of that way. And like, so one of the risk factors was like co-occurring health conditions, co-occurring mental health conditions, Um, But other things that we've talked about, like alexithymia and interoception, and I wouldn't have, I mean, it makes so much sense when I saw that, that alexithymia was on there or like lack of self-awareness, but I wouldn't have necessarily thought of that like on my own. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting, but it makes sense, right? If we struggle with self-awareness, especially body awareness, we're not as tuned in to our cues of when we're burning out or when we're fatiguing, um, and so that was really, int- that was one of the things that I thought was interesting was just that connection of self-awareness to burnout, which self-awareness and masking are also related. Like self-awareness just keeps showing up as um, like a pretty key factor for our wellness, I think, as autistic people. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, because if you're not able to identify certain emotions or sensations and they continue to build up and you continue to push yourself past that ability to manage them. It's going to lead to this feeling of burnout or this experience where it's just like, wait, the white flag, right? Like I can't do this right now. And yeah, it feels, Mm -hmm. I think this topic feels really heavy because I think so often we're just like, we need a solution. We need to figure out mm-hmm. why. How can we get out of this? How, like you said, how can I dig myself out from this hole? And then you compare that or contrast that with this feeling of like, there is no way. <laughs> like there's no way out of this. Do you ever feel that way? I do, but I, I for me, and it's it. It actually took me a while to tease this out. I think for a long time, be, because my long COVID exposure and my autism discovery happened within the same six months. I think I was misattributing a lot of my long COVID to autism. I was like, my autism diagnosis was after actually overshadowing my long COVID. Um, So for me that I'm never going to dig out is, is mostly related to the long COVID stuff um, and to the chronic. So yeah, chronic health. Um, And yeah, that's a pretty terrible feeling of like, I'm, what am I? I'm 39 and I feel my body feels like it's like 85. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I yeah. do have some hope. Like if I didn't have any hope, I want to be trying to make readjustments this year. So I, I do, I, I'm at a point, um, I did some kind of deep meditation around this. I, I think this is my year. I think if I don't reverse the cycle I'm in this year, then the next decade will be really rough for me. I think if I'm able to reverse some patterns and get into a healthier cycle, um, I, then I do have some hope. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a really powerful thing to name and to recognize. Kind of makes me think of the tarot reading that I did the other day because mm -hmm. what it was all about was like figuring out ways to set buffer time or boundaries around my time when I say yes to to protect my energy. And the person doing the reading was like, if you don't change this, this is gonna destroy you in the next couple of years. Like you have to change this. And the final card that they pulled was like this communal community storytelling sharing wisdom card and it's like oh my god megan and i are trying to create this community but neither of us have the time or the energy to create this community and <laughs> it just made me realize like how important protecting time and energy is and how poorly a job i do that okay. so often where like I thought to myself, I'm going to do this solo trip when I get done with all this travel and hosting and retreats and all the stuff that I'm doing. I'll take myself somewhere that I really want to go and I'll, I'll just drop in and I'll get really like connected and disconnected and mm -hmm. it'll be wonderful and I so need it. And instead, I booked a trip to Romania with my dad where like I have to attend and host and plan and do all of the things that are essentially destroying me. So my goal for this year, even though we talked about intentions in a previous episode, is to be almost ironclad with the things that I am now going to say yes and no to. Because like you just said, if I don't make some changes, the next 10 years are going to be really hard for me too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to hold in mind, like when the urgency and immediacy of the moment, right? Especially as ADHDers, like our future self feels so non-existent. So to yeah. hold that future self in mind when present self is making decisions, like I'm going to say yes or no to this, uh, that's really hard. It's, I, I I'm going to, I've been practicing kind of a meditative, like the, what I do, it's kind of like stream of consciousness, meditative practice I do before sleep. And it's, I'm distinctly playing out like these two lives of, um, of, of what the next 10 years could look like for me. And I, I have to do some sort of exercise like that to keep my future self front and center. Otherwise present self urgency, immediacy, novelty is always going to win. And that's frankly, part of what's kind of destroying me. Yeah. I get, we haven't really talked about that, but how like ADHD fuels burnout, like ADHD fuels autistic burnout because novelty urgency. Um, like, why did you say yes to Romania? Was that like a people pleasing thing? Was that an urgent, like, was that a novelty thing? Was it combo? I just explored this in depth with my therapist, Leslie. Um, I think that it was some people pleasing, but I also think there's an inner child part of me that's like excited that my dad wants to do something and wants to travel. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so exciting. And I'm not like, I don't have any buyer's remorse about it, but in hindsight, I should have stuck to my plan, which was like, go somewhere solo, drop off the grid. You have just got done with five months of attending and attuning and hosting and you're going to need it. And of course, that's not what I did. So that was very like immediately and glaringly obvious for me. And that does come into play with the ADHD side where it's like, there is novelty there. It's like, Ooh, there's all these castles. This looks really cool. This would be a cool experience. Like, let me get to planning this entire trip. And then before you know it, it's booked. And I'm like, mm -hmm. ah, like that's not what I wanted or needed. Well, that, I mean, I think part of what's complicated there is like, it was value consistent. Like it was a value consistent yeah. decision to do a trip with your dad. It's also value consistent to say no and take rest. And I think, yep. I mean, we've talked about clashing values on here before. Like that is one place where it can be really hard to say no of like, well, this, it, but it's consistent with my, um, yeah. okay. There's this other thing I, I learned about when I was diving in the habit literature, which is this idea of a Ulysses pack. So, you know, like in the, is it in the Odyssey? I should know this. I always miss up <laughs> where things come from, but where he wanted to hear the sirens, like the sound of the sirens, but he didn't want to get lured in to be destroyed. 
So he had his like sail sail people tie him up on the mast of the boat, um, and then put cotton in their ears and like said like, get your swords out and fight me if I try to like, you know, get undone so I can go, you know, swim with the sirens. Um, so he was making when he was in his like, in his mind, um, in his sane mind. He made a pact with himself for his future self. And I love that idea of like, when you're in a grounded space, how do you make Ulysses packs with your future to protect your future self? Um, but yeah, I think you and I both need some Ulysses packs for like how to say no to things um, this next year. I agree. I'm happy to try to hold each other accountable with that because it's so hard. And mm -hmm. we talked about it on a previous episode where you were talking about like bigger and bigger opportunities coming your way, right? As you continue to develop this really great reputation in the community, you're going to get more um, opportunities. And it is hard to say no to those things. Like we talked about, I almost feel like thinking about like present self versus future self, ADHD parts versus autistic parts. I always go to this, um, this image of tongue of war. And it's almost like this image of like the ADHD side pulling that rope so hard when something new and exciting and stimulating uh, comes up when I'm, in, when I'm bored or when I'm uh, depressed or when I'm feeling like stagnant or like I just am stuck. And that side tends to win out so often and now it's getting more interesting because I'm more, so much more aware of that, trying to do that zoom out of like, if you say yes, what does that lead to? If you say yes, what does that mean for you in the next six months? But it's so hard because it's so easy for that part of the brain to just be like, no, nah, this is this is exciting. <laughs> like, this feels good now. And we want to feel good now. We don't want to maintain for six months and feel okay. We want to feel good Mm -hmm. And I think that is the difference is like my system is so much more willing to feel good momentarily or in the short term and overlooking the long-term effects because the long-term effect is like, what's the alternative to just feel okay, to just get by, to just maintain it. My system's like, no, I don't want that at all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, even, and partly cause yeah, it gives that like momentary reprieve like that that bolt of urgency and dopamine and energy that comes with that like gives a momentary reprieve from the fatigue and the the burnout it's good to feel motivated um and that's something and luke is good at reminding that me of this too he's like you get excited but that goes away and then you have to do the thing <laughs> that's true yeah. yeah we okay we should start we should start a thing where from now on, if we say yes to anything for 2024, we text each other and we are like, this is what I said yes to. I think it's going to take this amount of hours. This is why I said yes. And were deal. we like, deal? Okay, let's do it. Deal. I mean, we're on air. We're, this is going to be out. We're the committing world, to so it. This is that's accountability at its finest. You know? A yes accountability. Yeah. Or a no accountability. So this, I, I actually, I just said yes to something yesterday. And I was, ha I've been like going back and forth for the last three weeks on, on this. And it's, it was very meta because Luke and I were talking about this last night. Um, the, my publisher who's publishing self-care for autistic people is interested in doing a second book on autistic burnout. And the first timeline they gave me was a really fast timeline. And I was like, I, I, I can't do that. And then they came back with a second timeline that is still more, more speedy than I would like, but I, I'm like sitting here debating like, okay, I think writing this book on burnout is going to drive me into burnout. So it was very meta, like, um, but I did say yes. And so I'll say no to everything else now. Heard that before. Um, so how do we stick to this? Because we're here talking about this from an from a very meta perspective and from a like zoom out lens trying to offer this like perspective to people who are listening 
yeah, we continue to fall into this trap of like, hey, this is exciting. And this goes back to so many of our recent conversations where we've been like, I just got a tattoo and it's like coming apart all over me. <laughs> um, this comes back to this part where we've talked about romanticizing the fantasy of what life could be like. And I think that that still wins out so much because when we talk about momentary day by day existence, moment by moment existence and how painful it can be and how hard it can be and how exhausting it can be and how lonely it can be, it's so easy to default to saying yes to the things that can try to shake that up, even if it's just a momentary mm -hmm. blip on the radar. I love that you connected this to fantasy because absolutely that is part of the yes. And I, and this is where I come back to like how important grief work is. Like, yeah. I think until, until we grieve our limits, like I am okay saying I have limits. I, well, part of me is okay saying that I don't, I certainly don't live or commit to things as if I have limits. So I obviously haven't fully grieved my limits because if I had, I think I'd have an easier time they know, but you're yeah. absolutely right. The fantasy that kicks in, um, the fantasy of not being limited, the fantasy of my future self can do this. That is often there behind the yes. Sorry, I'm listening to you and it's, yeah, the grief work is so important. My dog was barking, so I was just trying to think of it out. So, I saw a post today, I can't remember who posted it on Instagram, um, about how we check our own internalized ableism. And one of the bullet points was like, if you can't come to terms with the fact that you do have limitations and continue to push, push past those limitations, whether it be in society, whether it be socially, whether it be productivity wise. And I was like, hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't so yeah that's Absolutely. kind of what comes up for me when we're both talking about this yeah those are the two things oh gosh that's so interesting i actually think that was in my like original burnout book hopefully it's in the revision too of like i talk about there i mean there's like the surface level things to helping with burnout but then there's what i call deep psychological work and yeah. the two that i highlight are internalized ableism and grieving because until you address your internalized ableism, you're still going to be like pushing yourself to reach those neurotypical standards. And, and then the same thing with until you grieve and like create space to move through the grief of whatever your limits are, there's going to be some resistance. Um, so yeah, there's, when it comes to burnout, yes, there is like sensory soothing and rest, but there's also like deep psychological shit that we have to do yeah. like yeah you and i have been talking about this for like a year and a half of like and and we laugh right like what a what an interesting psychological defense we laugh about our overcommitment, but obviously we're still doing it i think despite doing a lot of deep dives in my own therapy about all of this and this identity and this this just lens that I see the world through now and experience and there's still a lot of grief work to be done and despite feeling that grief very heavily yeah continue to push past these feelings of limitations and capacity and there's still a part of me that doesn't want to admit like that I have these limitations that I have to honor them and I mean, I don't think I've ever really said that publicly before, besides maybe to you without recording or other people that are close to me. But I think that still exists very intensely where I'm like, I don't want to feel limited. And despite knowing that I am, and I pay for it though, by mm -hmm. exceeding those limitations and ultimately destroying my physical and mental health in, in the uh, meantime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. You know, what also has added to this is this throat issue that I have and vocal limitations and capacity hmm. being like compounded 
So there's this like internal dialogue of why me that happens sometimes, mm -hmm. um, which leads to anger and frustration mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. grief. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I think I have a parallel experience with the combo of long COVID and autism, that, especially because like, I, I know, I know my, where my early exposure came from and I have like, I have a lot of feelings about that. Yeah. Um, and so that the why me narrative and the, like, if I would have changed this one thing, what would my life look like narrative? There's a lot of ruminating right. loops that I try to avoid because they tend to not be very helpful. Yeah. Oh, I just took a monotropism quiz. Someone in my community shared it, which I thought was so cool. Like some there apparently there's a screener for monotropism. Um and I took it and some of the questions on there was essentially about rumination. And I never thought about that, that like ruminating is is related to like having a monotropic brain that kind of, you know, focuses intensely on a few things. Um, and I hadn't made that connection before. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense that if you're really monotropic, you're going to be more prone to rumination, which negative rumination increases stress, isn't great for burnout. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is a glimmer of hope today. Oh That's what we were trying to bring to the table. No, okay, no, I, mean... I did have, okay, let me share one concept. I don't know, I feel like this is an, ex it's like a shiny concept in my brain. Maybe it won't feel like this. Um, this was one of the things, and the newest research I wanted to share was on strategic withdrawal. First of all, I just love that concept or that term strategic withdrawal. So you and I both know, like we're in the mental health field, when a, when a client or a patient is showing a lot of withdrawal, that's typically a red flag for a lot of mental health things, right? So depression, people withdraw because lack of pleasure, self-worth issues, just no more motivation to connect. And it tends to deepen the depression. PTSD, people withdraw because they're avoiding trauma triggers. OCD, people withdraw from a lot of aspects of their life. Again, avoiding OCD triggers, anxiety. Withdrawal is bad. And that's how we're trained to see it as mental health therapists. Um, what this article is suggesting is a lot of autistic people will use withdrawal strategically, especially as they're going into burnout, as a way to manage energy, as a way to manage social input, and that we shouldn't just be thinking of withdrawal as maladaptive, but there actually can be adaptive use of strategic withdrawal. And I just, I thought that was really cool. I liked how they conceptualized it and that that to me is another place where I think we need to increase awareness among mental health therapists of like, if you've got a client you're working with who's in burnout and also depressed and you're worried about their withdrawal to realize like that, that might not be maladaptive. That actually could be a really important part of their recovery. I agree hundred percent. And I use that strategic withdrawal a lot and I've kind of reframed it because I do think we have such a negative association as if like, that's not something you should be doing. But I do that in simple ways where like, for social demand purposes, right? I'll put my phone in a different room an entire day so I don't have to respond to things. I don't have to be social. I don't have to be connected. I will like strategically cocoon or hibernate for a couple of days after events because I need to like, I think it's so useful to reframe it in that perspective of like, I'm doing this because this is what my system needs. Like I'm not doing this for any sort of negative maladaptive maladaptive coping strategy is just like this is actually going to help me in in a couple of days or a couple of weeks or whatever the case may be or even day by day so mm -hmm. i think it's a great strategy i think it's great and i think it's great language because i think mm -hmm. if you start doing that people around our life who don't understand burnout or don't understand autism can understandably get worried about us like oh my gosh i had a neighbor once who like loosely knew my parents and after the birth of my second kid and I, w I was not sleeping like and I was recovering from a complex birth and a c-section like reached out to my parents who lived in the same town it was like I, I think Megan Anna is having postpartum depression and it's like 
I, I was a like so tired. Um, B like definitely strategically withdrawing, but there's so many stories I've heard where autistic people or ADHDers will strategically withdraw, not have the language for it necessarily. And then people in their life will like get worried and, and think they're supporting them by either like in, in like calling for people to check in on them or like, it, it just makes people around us anxious when we start yeah. withdrawing. Yeah. Yeah. Which probably therefore in turn like leads to almost demand avoidance in a lot of ways mm -hmm. from our perspectives. If you have any of those traits, like I know if that was to happen to me and my mom just started calling me mom nonstop, I'm not going to answer the phone. Like there's mm -hmm. no, that's just going to make me not want to answer the phone even more. But yeah, I mean, people around us get worried if they don't truly understand, like, this is what this person's doing for this reason. Because typically in society, when we see people withdrawing, we assume mm -hmm. intense depression, suicidality, um, some maybe some intense substance use going on and shame around mm -hmm. it. We don't think about, like, this person's withdrawing because they mm -hmm. reach their limitations and they need to recharge. They need to get back to a place where they can ground again and, and feel regulated and feel like they can go back out into the world and, and kind of participate in it. So, yeah, that's, that's perhaps a good script. I know, I think scripts can be helpful in burnout just because we can't, it's hard to form words as well yeah. as like, I feel like the last like 10 episodes of our recording, I'm a testament of that <laughs> <laughs> hard to form words. Um, but I like having a script, <laughs> Um, of uh, like, thanks for checking in. I'm not suicidal. I'm, I'm yeah. doing some strategic withdrawal to, to replenish. Um, because I, I do think that that's the one that gets really dicey is when people are worried that the person's suicidal. Um, yeah. and if you're not to be able to have a script of saying, right. you know, yeah. thanks for checking in. Here's what's happening. Um, like it's dicey because then people start asking the question of like, so I'm worried about this person. Does anyone know how to do a wellness check? Do you call the police? And can you imagine oh. the stress of navigating a wellness check while in burnout? And that does right. happen, right? Like yeah. a, that absolutely happens. And that could be unbelievably dangerous, not just for BIPOC folks, but BIPOC autistic folks who maybe they're shutting down, maybe they're in autistic burnout and someone's knocking at the door and all of a sudden like you've got to come and present and answer questions and be responsive and yeah absolutely and you're not going to be able to mask um as well or at all oh. and um you i think in those moments if we're anxious unmasked stimming if someone doesn't understand autism like i could see how someone might be concerned around like psychosis or like this or that I don't know, but it could easily get misinterpreted to where it's like, oh, and this person needs X, Y, Z when it's like For that sure. person needs strategic withdrawal. And, right. and I, I do just my, now my, like, uh, my checklist is going off in my head. Like there, there are like burnout can lead to suicidality. So there are times sure. that, um, people do need that support, but so I'm I just want to be clear. I'm talking about the times where Right. Someone's in burnout. They're not suicidal. Um, they just yeah. need to be left alone. Yeah, absolutely. Important distinction. Um, but yeah, that's what that's why this stuff is so nuanced, right? Because immediately it's like, oh, I need to make sure I I now say this to like ensure that we understand that we that people can become suicidal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like this. Uh -huh. Oh god. Nah, so this is an I. Like. Well, this is an idea I've been playing with, and I, I'd love to like um, pull more more autistic people. Um, so, so we do know that burnout is a kind of pipeline, or not necessarily a pipeline, but a like one pathway to suicidality. Something I'm curious about. Um, I've definitely experienced this, and know others who have is not suicidality, but like a fantasy for non-existence, which is really like a yeah. fantasy for all demands to stop. Um, and I feel like it'd be, if that is what's happening, that's my hypothesis that there's a different kind of 
non-existent fantasy that's different than suicidality that happens for a lot of autistic people in burnout. And if that's true, I feel like it'd be really helpful to have language for that of like, yeah, my non-existence demand, demand cease to exist fantasy is, is here. Um, because that is, that is different than than suicidal. Yeah. I'm so happy you named that. I feel that way all the time. Like I've told my therapist that I tell my friends that I'm like, I just don't want to exist. It's not about not wanting to be here or to commit suicide. I don't want to have to deal with any of the demands that come with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like I just don't want to exist in that, in that world. Mm -hmm. I have Mm -hmm. this fantasy often of like disappearing into the woods and like into a cabin or into a something where I don't have access to technology. I don't have access to communication. I don't have access to anything. And I don't have to be responsible or responsive or any of those things. And that definitely is a fantasy I have very, very often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I have less of them now that my parent, my children are older. But um, I definitely, when they were young and the house was always overstimulated. I mean, I've shared this before. I like, had fantasies of just like getting, getting in the car and like, moving to another country and changing my identity and just... Um, Obviously, obviously, and obviously not actually wanting to, but like, again, allowing ourselves to have these fantasies that are not value consistent, but are telling us something important, right? Like that fantasy was not consistent with my values. I would never have done it, but it was telling me something about the level of fatigue and overwhelm I was living in. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I would love if we could develop some language around that stuff so that people could share that more openly because- I cannot imagine a world where you and I are the only two people who have had fantasies like this because life gets so overwhelming and so overstimulating that it feels like there is no answer or solution. Mm -hmm. Disappearing from it all, yet booking the trip to Romania with your dad. Maybe Uh, that's part of the saying yes. Maybe it's like, so in... um... So this comes more from psychoanalytic de- literature, but they'll talk about like the manic defense is a defense against depression. Um, and, and we're not in, in that language. It's not specific to bipolar, just to clarify. But I wonder if our yeses is, is like a manic defense to our desires for non-existence and our fatigue. Certainly makes sense. But it was the... Because if we feel the fatigue and the desire to kind of just mute everything out, basically all the pretty often, it seems like it would be a defense against that saying like, no, that's not what you're wired for as a human being. Like you're wired for connection and community and all the things that come along with our genetics. And it's like, well, my neurodevelopment says, no, I need this. Yet society is not necessarily created for people with our neurotypes. This is a depressing episode, Patrick. I feel bad for our listeners. I actually think the depressing episodes are the most popular episodes because they're (laughs) they're real and they're raw. That's where we get like most of our response. We're not trying to depress the people, all of you who are listening. It's just I think this is reality, and we're just processing through it so we appreciate you listening to our 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 takes on this i do like the um the very intentional like systematic withdrawal though is that the term you used i'm sorry uh strategic 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 with or Mm -hmm. strategic withdrawal i think that's a strategy for sure um i also think having the insight into the The yes versus no thing, like having the ability to have a check and balance system with a colleague or a friend or someone in your family or a partner, like like Megan and I just agreed to check our impulses in terms of saying yes to things this year. So if that is something you want more of or want support with, thinking about who can you have that conversation with where you can just send a text or you can just send a message where it's like there's no other expectation or context surrounding that. I think that can be very helpful too, especially for those of you who 
our ADHDers or ADHD autistic as well. Like that, that push pull is, is certainly very real. So it's hard to both coexist in the present and future tense in terms of how can I protect my energy and, and support myself. And I think that there are some strategies and they're certainly not as simplistic as just like go take a hot bath and like use a weighted blanket. But those are great strategies. <laughs> <laughs> those are great strategies. And, you know. I do love right, my weighted blanket. <laughs> weighted blankets, weighted stuffed animals, all the things we've talked about before with burnout and are in both of Megan's workbooks. So I think that there are things out there and it, it's not like there's just no solution, but I think it's important to also discuss the side of the things where it's like, this is pretty damn hard. And I think when we talk about the things that are pretty damn hard, it allows people who are listening and following and subscribing to feel related to. So I don't know. I think about that that way too. But heavy episode, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Be interesting to compare and contrast like episodes that we record in December and January and February. Oh my gosh. Versus like episodes in like June, July, August. I, I'm very interested to see what that looks like. Wait, that would be really interesting. I kind of want to go back and do that. This last summer for me was like messed up though because I, I had a resurgence of COVID. Um, so last summer doesn't count for me. But Clean slate, okay. new year, new year. Yeah, let's pay attention to that this summer. I, be, I bet it's so different. Oh, that'd be it's... interesting. What if we started talking about ADHD more? I bet we'd that'd probably would. If we yeah. start shifting our language to be like entrepreneurship, ADHD, all the <laughs> Let's start um, a new thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that would be an interesting experiment. So, <sighs> are we done? I think we're done. Yeah. I just, well, okay. This last lot, I feel like that's part of our podcast is we're like these lab rats and we just like do, ex <laughs> I don't know that we do experiments on ourselves, but we treat, we treat it all like an experiment, which is why, like, I'm not as comfortable with the expert podcasts. I like, yeah. I, I want to be, really I want to be a lab rat and just yeah. like, reflect on that. It works for us. And there are plenty of podcasts out there that, but, have different that do different awesome so, yeah yeah absolutely yep um, you know maybe one day we'll have the energy and we'll link a bunch of those too in our show notes but today is not the day <laughs> okay well all right i think we're done i think we're there <laughs> all right everyone thanks for listening to the divergent conversations podcast new episodes are out on fridays on all major platforms like download subscribe and share goodbye As you may know from listening to our podcast, I've been working on a book, Self-Care for Autistic People, and I'm excited to announce it's out this month, both in physical form and as an audiobook. As a celebration of its release, I'd like to share some excerpts from the audiobook edition with you, our podcast listeners. The book is designed as a book you can pick up for brief, easy five-minute reads with over 100 different entries that introduce you to practices for incorporating self-care. You can find the audiobook wherever audiobooks are sold, available on March 19th. Some studies have shown that autistic people are more prone toward using emotional avoidance as a coping response. And so, of course, I had to include an entry on the topic of emotional avoidance and how to move toward acceptance. Enjoy. I used to refer to my emotions as those pesky little things. I consider myself an emotion minimizer, which I used to chalk up to being a highly analytical and logically oriented person. And while this is certainly a part of it, I have realized a negative or shadow side to my relationship with emotions. In addition to being an emotion minimizer, I am also prone to emotional avoidance, and it has taken an active effort to unlearn my ways. Emotional avoidance is a common coping mechanism among many autistic people. When you suppress or avoid feelings due to fear or discomfort, 
you're unfortunately vulnerable to substance abuse, addiction, self-harm, and emotional numbing. Additionally, emotional avoidance heightens stress, anxiety, and disconnection from yourself and others, potentially contributing to chronic pain or other physical complaints. Moreover, it impairs your problem-solving abilities and hampers effective resolution of underlying issues. For autistic people, the inclination toward emotional avoidance is understandable. Many of us develop this in response to the too muchness of the world, the overwhelming sensory experiences and challenges we face in processing and expressing emotions. While emotional avoidance may provide temporary relief, it can have long-term detrimental effects on your mental health. When you embrace emotional acceptance, you cultivate positive coping mechanisms to acknowledge and engage with your emotions. It means granting permission for emotions to run their natural course. Positive coping skills include any methods where you are actively processing and working through your emotions. Here are some examples of positive coping. Journaling. Writing down your thoughts and feelings can be a powerful tool for emotional exploration and processing. Through journaling, you can gain insights into your emotions, identify patterns or triggers, and find clarity in your experiences. Mindfulness. Mindfulness practices involve bringing your attention to the present moment with curiosity and non-judgment, observing your thoughts and feelings without attaching to them or getting carried away, can help you develop a more balanced and gentle relationship with your emotional experiences. Therapy. Therapy allows you to work with a trained professional who can support you in exploring and processing your emotions. Therapists can help you develop coping strategies and gain insight into your emotions. Emotional expression. Engaging in creative outlets such as art or music allows you to express and explore your emotions cathartically. Creating art or playing music can provide a sense of release and offer communication when words are difficult to find. Emotional acceptance requires self-awareness and compassion. It involves recognizing that all emotions, including discomfort, provide valuable insights. By accepting and approaching your emotions with curiosity and kindness, you cultivate resilience and self-awareness to navigate life's challenges.